talking in between BLS sets. Sometimes this happens with the client, sometimes this happens with the therapist, but today's topic is going to be what is happening when people are talking too much in between sets in phase four. For those of you who haven't met me yet, I am Cambria Evans, the teaching and learning EMDR consultant coming from my office in San Jose, California, where I am still very virtual, <laughs> have been virtual for 15 months, and uh, excited to talk to you guys about a question that has been coming up quite a bit, actually, um, in my consultation groups. Uh, and I wanted to talk about it because the, we, we noticed this, rather, we're, we're talking too much or the client's talking too much in between sets. And I, I love getting curious about things, as you guys know. Um, and I was asking myself, like, what's going on? What's going on? And let's understand that and let's um, feel peaceful with it, right? Let's just, let's feel peaceful. Um, hope you guys are all doing okay. By the way, I just had my second vaccine. <laughs> and as we say in my house, holy cannoli, uh, that Moderna vaccine number two was had me on my on my butt for a couple of days so I'm feeling better but if you if you hear me a little bit tired that's why I'm recovering from the side effects of that um, but hoping you're all getting your vaccines hoping you're all feeling like you have more available options to you as we go into this new phase of of COVID hopefully a phase that feels a lot better than the last couple phases so let me go ahead and read this email from one of my um EMDR mom consultees. So I have uh, two types of consultation groups. One is a general consultation group for EMDR. The other one is EMDR moms. This is for EMDR clinicians who are also moms. And I started this um, during the pandemic and I'll continue after because I really feel like if you are a mother and you are an EMDR therapist, especially right now in the world, you are a soldier, you are a hero, uh, you are tired. <laughs> So when, when the EMDR moms get together, it's, uh, <laughs> it's an EMDR consult group, it's a support group, it's all sorts of things. It's, it's a very precious space. So um, this email is from one of my EMDR moms, um, and she says to me, hey, Cambria, I wrapped up an EMDR session, the second session, of reprocessing an unfinished target, very common. I'm realizing I talk too much, verbally processing between sets and helping the client make connections. She says, oh, how do I get out of this bad habit? How do I keep the client processing? She tends to take a minute to check in between sets and then feels like we lose momentum for the BLS. What she shares is on topic with the memory, so that's, that's good. Uh, we're making progress, but it, it's just really slow. Am I being impatient with the process? Any thoughts are appreciated. A similar dynamic has happened with other clients during phase four, so I know it's me and not just them. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my goodness. So there's so much there we get to talk about. I'm, I'm excited about it. So, so here's what I want to say. Um, as a mom of, of four-year-old twins, as a therapist, as a, a person in the world right now, I always want to come from a place of what is the positive intention of what's happening, right? Um, what is the positive intention of the behavior? And um, for those of you that don't know this yet, I, I am in love with two protocols. And I really only use two protocols in my practice. <laughs> Standard protocol and the feeling state addiction protocol. And the reason I love Robert Miller's feeling state addiction protocol is because the model essentially, the, the protocol essentially says that every behavior is linked to a positive feeling state, right? Which means everything that we do or choose is connected to wanting to feel good or better, which I think is lovely, right? And, um, you know, you can use this for addiction. I really use it for all sorts of things, right? Because I believe everything we're choosing has some kind of positive outcome intended. Oftentimes there's a consequence or limitation, but, but I want to believe people are good and want good things. So that, this is the framework that I'm using to understand and talk about this today. Um, so I'm asking myself a couple questions. So, so when this consultee, my EMDR mom consultee, 
who, by the way, can we just, can we just pause and just notice how like amazing this woman is (laughs) that she has kids, is a trauma therapist in a pandemic and is also not only able to notice herself and be curious about herself, but she's also able to come to me and ask me to be curious with her. Like, I'm just, I'm so proud. (laughs) I'm just bragging now. I'm just so proud of her. Um, but you know, this idea that I'm, that I'm doing something wrong, I'm slowing down the process. Um, this idea that, you know, what I'm doing, um, you know, doesn't have a positive intention. I want to come from this at, from a place of what is the positive intention when the clinician is choosing to talk in between sets more than we're supposed to, right? So we know that in basic training, we're taught that, um, you know, when the client's processing in phase four, we just basically have a couple options, right? They process, we check in before we send them off. We say, okay, go with that. Notice that, right? Or we have some kind of like interweave that we might use to help them connect learning, right? We're not supposed to talk and help them process things and ask a lot of questions and take them out of, out of processing. Okay. So I believe in learning styles, right? Whether it is the, the client or the therapist who is talking a lot in between sets, I do believe as an external processor that some people process externally and some people don't. Okay. So I, every thought I have pretty much is just coming out of my mouth. Like, I don't know. I don't even script these videos. I just get a question. I just come on here and just talk how I would in consultation group or to a friend. Right. And then my husband, right, is an internal processor and he will process by himself. And then he will say the like one or two sentences that he's come up with. So as, as an educator, right, at Stanford for many years, it is important for me to understand that everyone has their own way of processing information and their own way of learning, right? And I want to be respectful of my client's way of processing information. And I want to be mindful of my way of processing information, right? So my client might be an external processor, right? And if that's the case, I'm going to have a conversation with my client and say, you know, totally cool that you process externally. I get that. (laughs) And for this, for this protocol for processing, your brain is going to process faster than your mouth, right? Actually, when you're processing externally, there's a theory that this is actually slowing down your brain's processing, right? Which is why we don't recommend talking during BLS. Um, And then in between sets, we want to make sure that we're not interrupting learning and we're not interrupting your processing journey. Okay. And I'll have a very transparent discussion with the client and say, how do you want to navigate that? Right. How do you want to navigate, um, like balancing, like, you know, who you are and your learning style and way of learning with this protocol. And we talk about how we're going to do that. Some clients will say, okay, cool. I can, I can just kind of keep it, keep it shut and buttoned up and then talk after, you know, the, the BLS set is done. Some clients will say, yeah, I, this is my therapy and I I really do want to tell you everything I just saw. And I respect that. Okay. Will it go slower? We'll define what slower is. (laughs) I mean, we know that there is a, there is an end goal, right? To the target. We want to get to the end of the target, to the PC. We want the body to feel, um, quiet and calm, but there are other things happening in the therapeutic relationship during phase four, right? There are other therapeutic goals such as, um, I want to know that I can show up who, as who I am in this relationship. And if who I am is somebody who processes externally, I want that to be okay. And maybe that's a reparative experience this client needs more relationally than am I going fast enough towards this PC and the target? Maybe both are equally important. But again, this is a transparent conversation I'm going to have with my client and I'm going to name it and we're going to decide together, right? 
And if the client says, yeah, I want to actually go towards this target really fast. I don't, I don't want to have, I don't need to have that space to validate who I am and how I process information as an external processor. I might say something like, perfect. How are we going to remember that's the goal between us right now? How are we going to remember that we're prioritizing that therapeutic goal over the therapeutic goal of you showing up as you are authentically processing externally, right? So this way of thinking is different than um, coming from the kind of uh, pathologizing framework of, um, well, the client must be talking a lot because they're avoiding their feelings. Um, or something, something's blocking something and something, you know, okay. That language is so um, shaming and so distrustful of the client and really goes against what we know in the feeling addiction protocol, which is that every single behavior has a positive intention, right? So the purpose isn't to block anything. It's to, it's to have something positively happen and looking at it that way, I think can be really um, like a relief for the clinician, right? Um, it, it gets us less tense, like, oh, something's happening that shouldn't be happening right now and it's bad and I'm not doing my job and the client's not following the rules. And it's like, I don't want to live in that tense space, right? It's kind of like as a parent, if I have one of my girls whack the other one, right? I know that that's not cool and that's not supposed to happen and, and we'll talk about that, right? And we'll find a better way <laughs> that's safer. And I also know there's a positive intention to my kid hitting the other one. I know that there's a positive intention somewhere in there and I want to understand what it is and I want to help my, my daughter know that her positive intention is good and we should notice the positive intention together, right? I really wanted, I really wanted that toy. That toy is important to me, right? That's a positive intention because my daughter has this relationship with this toy and she's protecting the relationship, okay? It's our work together, whether it's parent, child, or clinician and client, to say, okay, your intention is, is pure and good and positive just like you are. And are we going to keep hitting or are we going to try something else, right? Because there's a consequence to hitting, right? It's important that people understand the consequence. So if the client understands this, the consequence of talking too much in between sets is that we're going to get there slower, if it's not hurting anybody, I would just say let them make a choice, right? Or do an experiment and say, let's try it one time without you talking a lot in between sets and just see what happens. Let's try it two times, let's try it three times. How does that feel compared to talking in between? Let them choose, right? Because this is their process, bottom line. If we are teaching our clients nothing else, it's that they get to have a choice now that they didn't have before when they were feeling powerless and helpless, that we are client-centered and that we are transparent, right? We are not the holders of the protocol and the holders of the secret EMDR information. We are, we're like, here, this is the, this phase. Here's what's supposed to happen in this phase according to the protocol. How is this going to look for us? And, and how are we going to modify this to work for us or work for you? Okay, make sense? Okay, so let's talk about my consultee. What is it all about when the therapist is the one doing more of the verbal processing in between sets? So I could go into the framework of, you know, the therapist is doing something wrong. Um, the therapist is, is slowing things down. And yes, according to standard protocol, yes, that is not supposed to happen. But where I come from, again, as a parent, as a consultant is, I wonder what the positive intention is that this therapist feels like she needs to help this client make more connections. I wonder what the positive intention is that this therapist wants this client's processing to go faster for her. Right? This is a different way of looking at this and speaking about this then you're getting in the way of your client, okay? I don't wanna pathologize or make anyone or anything bad, okay? Because, because what is true is that if you are someone who does parts work and ego states and all these things, we know that every part is, is working for us and, and, and on our side. Even if it doesn't feel that way or look that way from the outside, we know that every part of us has a positive intention, you know, unless we're like a sociopath, which is very rare. So I'm curious about the positive intention that my consultee has 
for this client. And I am asking myself questions like, um, you know, what is, what is driving the behavior, right? Uh, what is driving the clinician's behavior to help the client make the connections, right? Um, kind of beyond just giving an interweave. Is it because the consultee doesn't have interweaves that she needs? Um, is it because she feels like the client is dissociating and not really there and she's trying to like help her connect back to herself? Um, and then the next question I have for the consultee is what do you imagine will, hap will happen if you didn't help make the connections? Like what, what are you trying, what is your behavior trying to protect against? Like something bad happening? Um, is it that the clinician doesn't really trust EMDR in general? Is it that she's never had an experience with EMDR where she was able to just process? Is it because she had an experience with EMDR as a client where she had a therapist who did help her make the connections? Like she's learned somewhere that this is, um, got some kind of positive intention. And she has another part that's emailing me and saying, I'm getting in the way. What's up with me? Why am I doing this? Right? So we're seeing, <laughs> we're seeing some parts work here, um, in an educational way, which I think is so cool, um, to be curious about. Okay. Um, but thinking about like, what is the benefit of what you're doing? Is it for the, the clinician? Is it for the client? Right? These are the questions I would ask my consultee. And these are the questions that I want you to ask yourself, not just if you're process, if you're talking a lot in between sets, but anytime, okay? Anytime you notice yourself doing something wrong that's not in the, the standard protocol. Anytime you're like, huh, I'm not supposed to do that, but I did, right? These questions I think you can ask yourself are so valuable. Again, I'm inviting you to make a choice of coming from this place of what is the benefit, right, of, of me doing what I'm doing with this client. Like there's, there is a positive intention here because I do care for my client. And I feel like this process, going through this process, whether you're a consultant doing this for your own consultees or you're a clinician just noticing yourself, which by the way is so cool that you can do that, um, it's a very loving way, right? To, to notice yourself, to learn, to be curious about yourself and to experiment with your, uh, chosen behaviors, right? So let's say this consult consultee decides to, you know, experiment and say, I'm going to test this out. Okay. I, I am in an EMDR laboratory. I have my white coat on <laughs> my goggles. I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to test this out. I am going to not help, you know, make these connections for the client in between sets. And I'm just going to see what happens. And I'm going to take that data, whether it's external data around us in the therapeutic context, or it's internal data. Like, do I get more anxious? Do I feel more calm? What positive cognitions, negative cognitions, body sensations, old narratives, old learning is coming up for me when I do this experiment, okay? And again, this can be used for talking too much <laughs> or it can be used for any time where you're like, oh my God, I chose the wrong target or oh my God, I um, didn't give enough resources or I gave too many resources or oh my God, I chose the wrong energy. Whatever you think you're doing where you have a part that's choosing it and a part that's like, huh, that's interesting. Why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. When you have these parts of yourself, I would invite you to notice an experiment, whether you're in consultation or not in consultation. This is the fun part, y'all. This is the part where you get to know yourself as an EMDR clinician. And I want to invite you to, um, to embrace it and not be scared of it. Okay, because if you are committed in your integrity as a lifelong learner, this is where the fun stuff gets to happen for you, right? This is the gold, okay? So don't be scared of it. This is, this is your gold as a person who has one of the most incredible jobs on the planet, right? Um, so something to think about, something to try. Um, I will be talking to my consultee about, you know, her own answers to these questions, but I thought it would be fun to share them with you. Um, because a lot of the questions I get, um, in consultation and on email are around this idea, like I'm doing something wrong. And I want to always remind you that if you have this 
sen- this sense of like I'm doing something wrong and that feels scary or anxious for you, I want you to follow it and say, okay, well, are you harming anybody? Like just, just check that first um, because if there's not going to be potential harm, that's a different conversation than like I didn't do exactly what the protocol says to do, okay? Um, I hope that makes sense. I hope it gives you more comfort with yourself uh, with doing EMDR because what is true is that if you're not comfortable with yourself, if you're not comfortable with EMDR, you're not going to use it and then your clients aren't going to get to experience the magic of it, right? Um, and then we can't change the world. So um, love this question. Love my EMDR mom so much. Um, and just really appreciate you for taking the time to watch this video and um, give yourself permission to be curious about yourself and to know that we're always learning, we're always growing, and that is the best part of getting to be a human. So good to be with you all. Until next time, be safe, take care, and I am rooting for you and your success.